I'm going to talk about the carbon balance. And um, Ryan suggested that we, this should be an intensive workshop, so this is going to be an intensive presentation. Right. <laughs> You just pointed out that it's, that's what it is, okay. Well, this, is, this will be intensive. And um, this, this, carbon balance, um, this carbon balance approach is something that, that we have found that has been really useful and very valuable for us in the laboratory. And I, I wanted to just talk about it with you because um, I think that it might be helpful for you too. And um, I, I think it, we should take our time going through, how much, we have enough time? Take our time to stop. If anyone, if anyone is unclear, we should stop and ask for, if you, if you want to stop and ask for a translation in, in your um, lang native language, then I think we should, should do that. And um, please don't hesitate to, you know, to stop and, and, um, and go through this in detail. So first of all, I know that some of you already understand what the carbon mass balance is, but just for, um, just basically the, the measured mass of the carbon that is in the fuel should be equal to the measured mass of the carbon in the emissions. If that mass balance comes out okay, then you have a really good feeling that what you're doing is, is right. If it's way off, you know that something is wrong. That's basically the, basically it. Okay, we talked about this carbon mass balance a little bit at the meeting in January in North Carolina. Okay, and, and we talked about how people that measure emissions in the field cannot use a hood to capture all of the emissions, so they, they can't use the total capture method they use, oftentimes use the partial capture method, and they use a carbon balance approach to quantify the emissions from, from the stove. So the carbon mass balance method is used for partial capture for field work sometimes. Now, if you have a, a, an emissions collection hood, like the PEMS hood or the LEMS hood, you could also use the carbon balance approach instead of measuring the airflow. Measuring airflow is, is, can be tricky, uh, can be challenging for reasons that we talked about. So instead of, me instead of measuring the airflow, you can use a carbon balance uh, approach, and, and that works, and it, it can work well. But the best, thing, the best thing to do, I think, is if you, can if you can use the total capture method, you can measure the airflow, and you can use the carbon balance. Compare the carbon balance measurements with the total capture me measurements. If you can get agreement, then you really, that, you kind of have the gold standard for quality assurance then. There's a lot, of, lot more detailed information on the carbon balance approach at, at these links, but right now I thought we could just talk about some base, just some basics. Um, so, just for now for an introduction, this, this carbon balance is not required by the water boiling test. It's not a requirement. You don't have to do it. The ISO IWA does not require a carbon balance. The EPA method 5G, that's, a, that's the method that EPA uses for measuring emissions from wood burning heating stoves. That method does not require a carbon balance approach. But I think that using a carbon balance is very useful for your quality assurance and for finding problems that you have with your system and for increasing your confidence in your results. So this slide is from, um, is from one of the slides that we showed at the meeting in January. This is just what we've just now been talking about. This is the total capture hood and airflow measurement method here. Can you see okay, Marcel? Am I standing right in the way? Okay. So this this is the this is the approach that we use and we recommend. This is sim this is what the lems the lems is basically. It's using this approach. If if you keep your hood face velocity, um, like Dr. Prasad was saying, if you keep your hood face velocity less than 0.25 meters per second, then you have very slow moving air into the hood 
and that should not affect the performance of the stove. The, um, the dilution tunnel is a long, straight section of duct, right? Right there. How do we ensure 0.25 We use, uh, okay, the, the, question, the question was how do you ensure this uh, 0.25 meter per second? We use a hot wire anemometer that is capable of measuring very low velocities. So that's the best, that's probably the best way to do it. But if, if you have a design, um, you know, if the limb system is designed if you have a, the hood design that can, can produce that at your flow rate, you can maybe check it and be assured that it's less. Ideally, you'd want to check it in, at your lab, though. Yeah, yeah. So we measured it with the instrument that, you know, it's down to one meters per second. And so the register is zero, and then the zero. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the, the dilution tunnel is long and straight so that the flow inside of the tunnel is, is fully developed and uh, turbulent in uniform velocity profile. There's a negative pressure. You, the blower is at this end of the system, so there's ne negative pressure all through the system. That means if there's any air leaks, the air goes into the, the air does not leak out of the system. The air leaks into the system, and then it's not a problem. And then, again, the dilution tunnel minimum air velocity is um, 3.7 meters per second, and that's so that you have uh, fully turbulent flow. Okay, and just briefly, this is a figure from EPA method 5G, and this is um, for measuring emissions of particulate matter using the dilution tunnel approach. This is how all, all stoves that are sold in the United States have to be certified by this method and what we're, the, the method that we're using is, is similar to this method. This method has been used for years, and it's, it's a reliable method for quantifying the mass of PM um, emitted from wood burning or biomass burning stoves. So this is the carbon mass balance equation, and this is just saying that the, the carbon in the fuel that you start with minus the carbon in the char that remains at the end of the test is equal to the carbon that's in the CO2 emissions, CO, carbon monoxide emissions, total hydrocarbons, and PM. Okay? And please stop if there's any question about any of this. Okay, so let's, let's just go walk through a, a basic calculation here. And it's, it's really an easy, it's an easy thing to do. Um, Let's say, let's say that, can, can everyone see the text from back there? Okay. okay. So let's say we do a test. It, you can be using the water boiling test protocol or you can use any protocol. It doesn't matter. Let's say you start with 400 grams of dry fuel and you have to, you know, you, 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 you can do the calculation to find out what your dry weight of fuel is. The fuel is not actually dry. The fuel has 10 percent, 15 percent moisture, but use the do the calculation, find out what the dry, um, the dry mass of the fuel is, okay? So if you're using wood fuel, wood fuel has about 50% carbon. And we've tested all of our wood, and all of the wood that we've tested has been between 49 and 50%. So the default value is 50%, so that means that 50% of the mass of wood is carbon, okay? And if you can do the fuel analysis, then you, you, know, you, know, then you know exactly how much carbon it, it is in it. But for most, most wood, the default value is good enough. So, so that means you got 400 grams of dry fuel. That means there's 200 grams of carbon in the fuel, okay? At, at the end of the test, you have 30 grams of char that's remaining. Okay, and we've, we've done the fuel analysis on the remaining char for rocket stoves, and we found that the char that rocket stoves produces is usually about 92% carbon, okay? So there is some uncertainty with this number, okay? Because your stove may not, the carbon content might be different for different stoves. So you don't really know this number unless you do a, unless you do a fuel analysis. But 
Um, but 92% is, this is from fuel analysis here, so that means 32 grams of char has 28 grams of carbon that's in it. Now, if you, um, you've done your emissions measurements and you found that you have 570 grams of CO2, with the LEM system, does that give you an output with the total amount of, would, you, would the LEM system tell you this total amount? So if you're, if you're before, I, I'm just curious, um, how many people in the room are using the LEM system? Raise your hand if you're using a LEM system. Okay, and any, is anyone using a PEM, a PEM system, not a LEM system? Okay, and is, does anyone use a system that's similar to the LEM system, but something that they built themselves? You guys? Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, your system is similar. Okay, so, so with the LEM system, the LEM system is gonna, the software will do the calculations and will tell you that your test has produced 570 grams of CO2. And then, this is, this is easy to do this calculation, just multiply 570 times 12 over 44. That's just you know the molecular weight of carbon divided by the molecular weight of CO2. So that means that you have 155 grams of carbon in the CO2. And most, most of the carbon that's in the emissions, most of it is in the CO2. So 150, you started with 200 grams in the fuel, you have 28 grams left over, 155 comes out in the CO2. That's where most of your carbon is. And you find you, that you have 20 grams of carbon monoxide, and the LEMS will tell you that too, or if you have your own system, you, you, you've got that information. And again, you multiply it by, the, by this appropriate fraction here, that 20 grams of, of CO, that's nine grams of carbon. Now, with the carbon monoxide, that's usually a relatively small amount of carbon, but it can be significant. So, so we need to measure carbon dioxide and we need to measure carbon monoxide to do the carbon balance. Now, with total hydrocarbons, that's something that we're measuring, and that's something that I don't think, probably, may, maybe some of you are measuring that, but probably not, but it doesn't matter, okay? Because total hydrocarbon emissions tend to be very low anyway. So, and um, when you do the, do the calculation with total hydrocarbons, it's a negligible amount, so you, you can just, you, you can just neglect, neglect the amount of carbon that's in the total hydrocarbons. If you have it, that's fine, but you don't have to have it. And then PM, particularly... Okay, good question. That's, be, that's because we're, make, we're assuming that it's like propane. We don't know that, but we, if, we assume, if we assume the total hydrocarbons are like propane, our, our, our propane, then, then it's, it's, uh, that's, the, um, that's the amount of carbon that would be in propane. If we assume that on average, the carbon number is going to average out to about, sorry, thank you. If we assume that on average, the number of carbon um, atoms in the total hydrocarbon emissions that we're measuring are going to average out to about three per molecule, then we equate it to propane, which is why we have 36. Thanks. Uh, okay. Sure. Yeah. So this this is from this is from our measured values here. So this for this example, it's from our measured value. Did you check with Kirk? Why are taking point eight? Does Kirk use point eight as a default value? Charcoal in the field looks like you manufacture charcoal versus. Yeah, yeah. The charcoal that's produced in the field has less carbon in it than the charcoal that's produced in some stoves because the the temperature is higher in the stove, so it it concentrates the carbon more. So you can actually produce higher quality carbon, uh, higher quality charcoal in a stove than you can by the field methods. Yeah, and there are very few measurements of char actual char that's produced. There are a lot of measurements of carbon, but I don't know a lot of published estimates of char that are out in the world. 
So this is a good data point if you guys are going to publish what you're getting from doing your test. But I already suggested that paper to John. Nice. Like, yeah. like how you guys work. <laughs> okay. Um, any other any other question on this so far? Um, so, with with the particulate matter, the, the PM is is such a, an important indicator of, of emissions. That's why it's it's really our most important measurement uh, to characterize the emissions from the stove. You know that 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 really shows how well how good the stove is, how good the combustion is. And it's important for the health effects. And so the PM is a very important measurement. That's why you know, we're, we're measuring PM. We're measuring it gravimetrically. But for the carbon balance, there's hardly any carbon in the PM. So for, for, for doing the carbon balance, the PM doesn't matter very much. The PM matters a lot for characterizing the performance of the stove. But for this carbon balance method, even a, stove, even a stove that produces a lot of soot, and you see all that black soot coming up, there's actually, there's actually not very much carbon um, in the particulate matter. So this is for a typical stove that is, is not particularly clean. You've got a half a gram of PM. And then if you're doing the ECOC analysis, then you know what the fraction of carbon is in the PM if, you, if you're doing that, but it comes out to 0.4 grams. So this is also something that, that we can, uh, if, if, you don't, if you don't have this ECOC um, analysis for your PM, if you don't know what that is, you, you can neglect the PM when you do your carbon balance. Okay, any question? Okay, so this is the same, this is the same calculation um, just, a, just for a, a hypothetical example, so from the numbers from the last slide, we find that we started out with 172 grams of carbon in the fuel. Now, if our carbon balance was perfect, we'd find 172 grams in the emissions too, but if we add these up, we find that we had 165 grams in the emissions. If you do a percent difference calculation, it comes out to 4%. Um, four percent difference. That is great. If you can get if you can get it that close, you are you you know you have good confidence that your measurements are 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 good. Now, if you neglect the carbon and the in the total hydrocarbons and the PM and do the calculations, it's five percent. It makes it doesn't make much difference. It's still great. Okay. So now, what happens? What happens if the carbon, if you do your carbon balance and it's not great, what happens if it's way off? And what, what if there is 30% more carbon in the fuel than in the emissions? And this is a real problem that Seth and I had that we struggled with for a long time. There was, we had a, we had a systematic, we did lots of stove tests and we were consistently finding somewhere around 30% more carbon in the fuel than in the emissions. You know, so when we first saw the problem, we thought, oh, well, you know, this should be easy to solve. It was not easy to solve. It, was, it turned out to be different. So what could be wrong? And I'm going to open it up to the audience. Tell me if, if it was off that, if, if our carbon balance was off that much, what could be wrong, Dr. Prasad? Okay, can we have... Do we need the mic? He's got one right. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay, so emission, that, that is the first thing we thought of, too. Emissions were, if emissions are escaping from the hood, then um, that could cause that problem. So we couldn't see any emissions escaping from the hood. We couldn't, we couldn't see it, but we occasionally, we could smell, we could smell a little bit of emissions in our lab. So we thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe we're losing something. And in the process of trying to track down where that smell was coming from, we found a, um, a, uh, one of our instruments had a, a vent on it. And that we thought that the vent was, it wasn't properly vented to outside, and that's where the smell was coming. We thought we had solved the problem. We fixed that. That's not what it was. We put, we put sensors all around our hood to try to sense where the emissions were leaking out of the hood. We could not find any emissions leaking out. We used our hot wire anemometer to make sure the flow was going into the hood, not coming back out, like you mentioned. It, that wasn't the problem. So, um, 
So these are all ways that you could check that. So what else could what else could be wrong? Anyone? <laughs> If the sensor is too slow. Sensor too slow. Yeah. The which, which sensor, Sam? The CO2 sensor. OK, so if the, if the CO2 sensor was too slow, if it, had a, if it had a time lag, right? If it was too slow. But remember, these, these, these measurements were integrated over an entire test period. So even if the sensor was, was slow, then the measurement over the integrated over the entire time period still ought to give you this is this is this still ought to give you this you know approximately the same amount of um, co2 emissions over the test right what else could be wrong there's a lot of things that could you see see all these things that affect it now you, we know these don't affect it very much but everything up here affects it what what else could affect the carbon balance. How about the fuel in the car? Anything from that? What? Any kind of ignition radiation? Okay, the question is any type of ignition material. That's a good, that's a good idea. So, in other words, if, if we were using some ignition material um, that was not included, not included in this, that could produce, that would, that would produce um, more carbon dioxide in the emissions that we weren't accounting for here, right? But that, that would make the carbon balance go in the opposite direction. We would be finding more, more carbon in the exhaust in the emissions than we would in the fuel. But that's a good thing, that's a good thing to think of, you know? That's the, that's the kind of thinking that this, doing this carbon balance gets you to think, you know, what could it be, what could it be? And it gets you to, to check things that you might not have checked if you had, you know, if you weren't doing these calculations, right? So what else, what else? There's, there's many other things that it could be. There's wet basis, strange, wet basis, dry basis. Okay, is this John, John talking here? Okay, John, John said volumetric flow rate through the duct itself. That, that is what, I was convinced for a long time that was it because if, you're, if your volumetric flow rate measurement, if your air velocity measurement in your duct is not, is not correct, then this measurement will not be correct, right? Because the, the way that the, the LEMS calcula calculates it or the way our spreadsheet calculates it, this, this, this uh, amount of CO2 and this amount of CO is depend, depends on your airflow measurement. So if your airflow measurement is not right, then your CO2 and your CO emissions are not going to be right. So we thought that was the problem, and we, um, we have a metrology lab at EPA that you know, calibrates. We had them calibrate our, our airflow sensor multiple times, and I, we, we couldn't find anything wrong with that. We, we could not find anything wrong with the airflow measurement. And we kept hoping that we would find a problem with the airflow measurement that would explain the carbon balance being off. But we could not find it. And in the end, in the end it turns out that it was not the airflow measurement. But that is an excellent, excellent point. Thank you, John, for making that point, because that will that, that will throw off your measurements and will affect your carbon balance. Michael. Uh, um, my, my thought was a difference between wet basis and dry basis for the wood. But okay, so the difference, the difference between, Michael says the difference between the wet basis and dry basis, this is, this is a calculation that's built into the water boiling test protocol. And that would, if, if you were using that, if you were using the, um, well, no, wait a minute, I'm getting confused with the equivalent dry basis. You're saying... You're, you're if you're adjusting for moisture content, you, if you use wet basis when you're really measuring uh, dry basis or vice versa, then you're right. going to be, you can be off by quite a bit. Okay, so if you're moisture, if you're using wet basis versus dry basis, then you're, when you do that calculation to convert your moist wood to dry wood... Yeah, your denominator that changes. That denominator changes. Yeah, that's... That, that, that's, a, that's something that could throw off, that, that could throw off your measurement. 
here of this 400 grams, right? So that's something that could, that's something that could affect it, but that's not what it turned out to be. And I don't think Jim could admit that if he did. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I would admit it. Oh, he would admit it. <laughs> I would. Um, Sam, you need a microphone. Okay. Just not knowing how much charcoal you have versus how much wood you have. If you mismeasure the charcoal by 10 or 15 grams. Yeah, the charcoal, be, because the charcoal, okay, sorry, the, the, Sam said uh, one thing that could throw it off is if you mismeasured the amount of remaining char. Um, that could throw things off because there is a lot of, the, the fraction of carbon in the remaining char is high. So that measurement of your remaining char is critical. And um, it's also, you know, for your efficiency measurement, that it's also critical for the efficiency measurement. If you don't get this right, that can throw it off. But, um, but we experimented with stoves that had no remaining char, like, you know, like a, a gas stove with no remaining char and our carbon balance was still off. So that was, that's a good idea, but that's not what it was either. Leaks in your sampling tubes? Leaks in the sampling tubes. That is, you're getting warmer now. <laughs> okay. So if you have, a, if your sampling tube is leaking, then that dilutes what your instrument is seeing and that could mess that could mess up or it could make your measurement incorrect that could make your measurement of co2 or co correct and let me show you let me show you how we calibrate Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have a compressed gas cylinder with 9,000 ppm of CO2. This is what we use to calibrate the CO2 analyzer. Now, with our system, we have, we have a sampling probe sticking in the duct here. We go through a heated filter, a heated sample line, a heated pump, a condenser. Now, the, the LEMS doesn't have you, you don't need a heated pump because you're not sampling all the same pollutants that we are. So you don't, you don't need all this stuff, but you still have a sampling line that runs from the duct to your, to your instrument, right? So the, the EPA methods for calibrating gas analyzers require us to first do a direct injection. That means we shoot this, this is also called span gas or cal gas. So this, this cal gas goes directly to the analyzer. And then we, we check to make sure if this is 9,000 ppm cal gas, then the analyzer should be reading 9,000 ppm, right? And then after we do that, then we do what is called a bias check. And the bias check, with the bias check, we, sh we shoot the span gas all the way up here to where the probe is, and then the span gas comes all the way through the whole system. And the purpose for that is if, if you have a leak or if you have a problem in, in this system here, then, then if you have a problem, then you, you won't read the same thing as with the direct injection, right? That's, that's, the, that's the idea of it. So, so what we were, we were using this method, we were shooting it both ways. We were shooting 9,000 ppm in this way, got 9,000 ppm, everything looked good. We thought we were, we thought we were great. We thought, our we thought our measurements were perfect here, okay? This is, we'll come back to this. Any, well, first of all, before we, how are we doing with time? I don't want to take too much time, but. The target is breaking at 3.30. Okay. All right, so any, before, before we move on with this, 
Any, any other ideas of what the problem could be? Any other ideas? I think we've covered, have we covered just about everything that it could be? Yeah. OK. I was going to say something about the uh, carbon content of the remaining char, but I think that kind of got accounted for in what Sam said about mismeasuring the, the char that was remaining. OK. All right. And because when Seth and I were struggling with this, we started thinking of all kinds of, we started th thinking of all kinds of other, you know, things that it could be. Um, but like, it, like carbon dioxide absorbed in the condenser was one thing at one time we thought of. Yeah. Uh, you need yeah, a mic, mic, mic. Emission. Oh. Get major frequency of emission from the measurement inside the uh, laboratory or the background concentration of carbon dioxide uh, or the uh, dilution year that you are uh, using for di diluting the concentrated gas, so carbon dioxide concentration of those combustion year or dilution gas is very important to measure for this carbon balance. So the background concentration yeah. of CO2, that, that is very important because the background concentration is about 400 ppm. So for carbon dioxide, that's high. So if, if somehow our background concentration was wrong, that we used the wrong one, that could throw it off. Thank you. I, thank you. I forgot about that one. Anybody else? Anybody else can think of any other, any other thing that it could be? Okay, so let me just, we'll, we'll come back and I'm gonna, keep, I'm gonna keep everyone in suspense before I tell you, <laughs> before I tell you what, the, uh, what the problem was, all right? Um, so this, this chart just shows you, we showed this chart at the meeting in, in January. This shows the, the concentrations over time when we do the, the calibration. First we do the direct injection with all of the instruments the green line is the CO2. So we do the direct injection, it goes up to 9,000 ppm. Then we do the bias check, it goes up to 9,000 p.m. Then we run the test. We're also checking for zero down here, and then the other ones are the diff other different instruments that we use. Okay, so while we were trying to figure out what the problem was, we, we got to the point where we just could not figure out the problem. And then Seth had a great idea, okay? And th I, think, I think this is, this is really, this is a great idea, and I want to make sure to give uh, Seth credit for this. He said, what if we took some CO2 that was 100%, okay? This, this is 100% CO2, and what if, what if we just injected this CO2 at a known flow rate directly into the hood? That, that then tests the whole system, you know? That tests everything all at the same time. And it turns out one of, one of the, another beautiful thing about this idea is that I think that 100% CO2 is available everywhere. I think you, can, you, you, can't, uh, you can't get uh, calibration gases in Honduras but I think you can, you can get 100% CO2 everywhere. It does not have to be research grade. It can be, um, you know, they use it for soda fountains and for lots of, you know, industrial purposes, right? So I think, you, I think you can find this anywhere, and it's very cheap, too. A calibration gas costs hundreds of dollars, but we're, we're buying cylinders of, uh, of this very cheap. It lasts a long time. It's liquid. When it's 100% when it's CO2, it's liquid. CO2 in the uh, in the cylinder, okay. When it comes out of the cylinder, it's when it comes out and changes from a liquid to a gas. It gets very cold. It 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 has a refrigeration effect. So you you put the gas through some coils. And we have an electric heater that we're just blowing heat on those coils to warm the gas up. Or or you could just stick these coils into a bucket of water. If you put these these coils in water, then you warm up the gas to ambient temperature. We're using a mass flow controller to control the, the flow rate of CO2 into the hood, but a mass flow controller is expensive. I think that just a, uh, a simple rotometer could be used to, uh, I think that would be a low cost alternative. And th this would be a way to check your entire system. 
Okay, so when you're checking the entire system, that means that, well, I'll come back, I'll come back to that before I, I get into that. Um, so, the next thing we need to do is we need to calculate, when we, when we inject a certain amount of CO2 into the hood, we need to calculate what the concentration in the duct should be. This is the calculation for doing it. The concentration of the CO2 is, is just, it, it's simply the flow rate of the CO2 divided by the flow rate in the duct, and then you have to add the background concentration, as you mentioned here. Okay, and these slides are all going to be available to everybody um, after this workshop. So if you want to do this calculation, then you know you can re you can refer to this if 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 you want to. Let's just do an example calculation. I think it's easier to you know easier to explain it with an ex example calculation. If you have a six-inch duct like like we do then the uh, cross-sectional area of the duct is this. And if you're running at about 750 feet per minute like we are, then, then your uh, air velocity is 230 meters per minute. And so the flow rate in the duct is, is this in liters per minute. And let's say, that we in, let's, just, let's say that we inject 25 liters per minute of CO2. Okay, and we do the calculation, and if we inject, if we're running at these conditions, we inject 25 liters per minute, then the concentration in the duct should be about 6,700 ppm. Okay, any question, any question on that? So, so we, we know what the concentration should be. Let's come back to this picture. All right, now I'm gonna explain uh, what happened with our experiment. Okay, so we're injecting this, this, this um, and, and Seth and I happened to be, be on, in the lab on a day when nobody else was there. So it was just Seth and, Seth and me. And we set this up, we injected this, this um, CO2 into the hood, and we looked at our CO2 measurement, and we were measuring about, about 30% our CO2 measurement was about 30% lower than it should have been. So, so we started to get exciting, excited right away because, because right away that this was indicating that yes, we did have a problem. Yes, it's, it's quantifiable now, right? We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be seeing 6,700, we're supposed to be seeing 6,700 ppm, but it's 30% lower than it was supposed to be. So we said, aha, it's not, you know, we know the problem is with the CO2 measurement or something, you know. We, we, we knew that we were on to the problem then. So one of the things that we had been thinking about was what if, what if this line was leaking here? Mike, Mike asked about sample line leakage. What if, this, what if this line had a leak in it so that when we were, when we were calibrating, we were pressurizing this line and the gas was leaking out, but when we were running a test, it was sucking air in and that was diluting our measurement. So the first thing we did was we pulled this line off and we, to, see if, to see if that corrected the problem, you know? We were all excited. We pulled the line off and we thought, this is going to fix it, but it didn't, okay? So that wasn't it. So then we, we thought, well, what's the next thing that it could be? Well, what if, this, what if the heated filter what if the heated filter leaked? Well, that's under a negative pressure, so if it had a leak in it, then we should, we should see that leak when we do the bias check, right? We should see that, right? But we thought, well, let's, let's pull it off and see what happens. Okay, we pulled, the heated, we pulled the heated filter off, we stuck the line back together, and we got 6,700 ppm. That was the problem. The, leak, the, the heated filter was leaking, and we didn't think that that could cause a problem. That was the problem, and that was, that was probably the most exciting day in the lab when we finally <laughs> discovered that that was what the problem was. And we never, we never would have found it if we hadn't looked at the carbon balance and if we hadn't used this, this method to chase the problem down, okay? so. We, we would never have known that that was the problem. We were, follow, we were following the EPA method to the letter, 
But it turns out that when you pressurize, this, this was leaking. So when we were calibrating, we were shooting the Kel gas in here under pressure, and it was, it was leaking out, it was coming out through the leak here in the heated filter. Okay, so it, the, the gas was coming out, and we were still getting the correct measurement, right? Do you see? Do you see that? So the, the, the heated filter. So we did the calibration. This was under positive pressure. The CO2 was leaking out. It was still 100% cal gas going to the instrument. Okay, but then when we did the test, this is all under negative pressure. So then it was sucking air in to the heated filter and diluting the measurement and that's that's what caused the problem and then you know af after you find the problem then it seems you know it seems so easy well why it's just obvious but but um, but I, I I think you know the carbon balance method helped us to find the problem and this this um, this using this 100 percent co2 was really a key in helping us to chase the problem down. And I think it could be useful for the regional testing centers to do this check. Now when you do this check, you, you, still, you still will need to check your carbon monoxide sensor. You still have to check the calibration on that separately. But this, this, is, this tests the whole system. It doesn't just, it doesn't just test your analyzer. If, if, that, if that measurement is not, if, if, if this was not 6,700, then that means that your air velocity measurement could be off. Any, anything could be off. All of those things that we talked about before that could throw your measurement off, any of those things could cause, could cause your, your, um, your measurement to be off. When you inject the CO2, you're, you're checking your whole system, and um, it, it, gives you, you know, it can give you a lot of confidence that your whole system is, is working right. right? And couldn't you do the CO through the front to do calibrate your whole system too, or to check your whole system for CO too? Well, see, the, the problem, the problem with, with if you have a cylinder of 100% CO, the CO is highly toxic, and it's it's. You, you can't account for a lower concentration. I mean, you could, you, you could. So you, you, I mean, yeah. Actually, you could do that. You could do that, but flow is I think 100% CO uh, is something that. It's, da it's dangerous. No, I was thinking if it was, if it was 50, 20% CO, could you just make, pretend like it's five times the flow amount? You know, yeah, you yes. could. You, yes. Yeah. 20% CO is the highest CO. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, percent, whatever percent, could you adjust, could you adjust the flow? You adjust you, your flow. You could, you, could, you could inject CO directly into the hood, but you'd have to inject a, a fairly high concentration because there's so much dilution. So you'd have to use you'd have to use a concentration that was much higher than the, the Kel gas. So, but you could do that. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, John. That sounds like a great idea. Is I, I'm not familiar with that method. Is that something that that could be done at fairly low cost for regional testing centers? Oh, oh, uh, oh John, can you hold on just a second? Uh, we had someone that wants to repeat. Uh, couldn't quite hear in the back row um, what you said. So, uh, is there a way to turn the volume up or? Okay. Can, uh, all right. So. You you used tell tell me again what you used John a solid block of carbon oxide. So, uh, carbon dioxide, so uh, dry ice. Dry ice. Dry ice. Dry ice. Very, very common in the states, and it turns out it's it's high purity. We struggled with whether or not it was going to have some moisture in there, and it turns out it doesn't. And we would literally just put it down to a band, and it's sublimed, so let's put it into it, and it goes directly from the solid. Those over time, and that would give us a true end to end 
well, did, did you, did, okay, so did, does everyone understand they're using um, carb, uh, dry ice, dry ice, carbon dioxide, and then did you measure the mass of the carbon, uh, of the uh, dry ice before and after, so you know how much mass is released? Probably wasn't an after. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So you, yeah. yeah. So you wait it before. Yeah. You wait it. You wait it before, so you know how much mass is there. You put it in the hood. You let it sublime. You know how much carbon dioxide is re released. Yeah. That sounds like a great. That sounds like a great idea. Do you have a patent on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, is is dry ice widely available in in other countries? I'm, yeah. Got lots of real ice in Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> Wet ice. And how about the CO2? Yeah, well, thank, thank you for that, John. Um, Ryan, is there, you have a microphone? Yeah, I have a quick question and then a comment. Well, okay. so do you see the need to even do the bias check if it doesn't even, like I don't see how it's even useful if it's well, the, the, identify a leak? Okay, so it didn't identify a leak, and um, but there are other reasons for doing the bias check. Like for, we're measuring multiple pollutants and sometimes the line can become contaminated so that you're absorbing, absorbing pollutants onto the, onto the, um, to the uh, dirty line, basically. So, so it's, it's, there, there are more reasons than just checking for a leak for doing the bias check. And it's in the EPA methods, you know, it's, it's there for good reasons. So, so we're, we're still doing the bias check, and, and now we're doing, the, we're doing a separate leak check now. So we, we have a valve here now, so we can close this valve now, and then we use this pump to pull a negative pressure and make sure that it holds a negative pressure. Then we're, then we're sure that we don't have a leak here. And we're, we are periodically using the CO2 injection just to verify that everything is, everything is okay. Okay. If the sampler drawing velocity is uh, lower than the uh, flowing velocity in dilution tunnel, the sample will not get whizzed to the uh, sampler also, and it will not give you the result. If the sampling velocity is too low? Yeah. So, so it takes too long for the CO2 to go through the sampling line yeah, yeah. to the instrument? Yeah. To? Or, 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 or the carbon dioxide may not reach to the sample. Right, right. Good, good point. So let me, let me to, to address that point, let me go back to this slide. So um, what, what I think you're saying is when you're, when you're doing the calibration, if, if, you're, if you have a long sampling line, if it takes a long time for the Cal gas to get to the instrument, the, the instrument may not be measuring ex the, the full concentration. So what we look for when, when we do the direct injection, we're looking for this line to level off. Like, like, like let's look at this instrument here. See, th it, takes, it takes a long time for that cal gas to get to the instrument, and we want to be sure that the concentration has, has leveled off so that it's in equilibrium. Um, to, to avoid to avoid a mistake like that. Okay. Well, so I just wanted to add that the Lenz data processing spreadsheet calculates the carbon balance to show the percentage of the carbon in the fuel compared to the carbon in the emissions. So that's something that you should be looking at every test to see if it adds up. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. So it's in the LEM spreadsheet. Is it in the water boiling test spreadsheet? Is a carbon balance in the, in the WBT uh, spreadsheet? I think it actually is now. No, it is. And that's something I can talk about with the uncertainty. OK. Yeah. All right, so it's already built into the spreadsheet. It already does the calculations for you. 
And you know, if you look at that number and you see, for example, we, we've had this, we've, we've seen this before, where we have, more, we have more carbon in the emissions than we had in the fuel. You know, that's impossible. You can't, you can't have more carbon in the emissions than you started out with in the fuel, right? So then, if you see that, then you know you, you have a problem, and then, then you know you have to have some work to do to try to find the problem. So that's good. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. And thanks to Jim and Seth for sharing this. I think it was great to hear an example of a problem that they had that they were struggling with, and how did they figure it out. I would encourage everyone to think about what challenges you guys are facing and don't be afraid to share it. It's, it's not, this is not an environment where like Jim and Seth came up and said, here's our problem and we're not saying, oh, what's wrong with you? Why was, why was there a problem? It was, it's a learning experience for all of us. So as you come across these kinds of examples and want, or, or can think of them and want to share them, I would definitely encourage everyone to do that. And I think also, is John talking? <laughs> I'll move closer to John. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard to tell when you're talking, John. Were you saying something? You weren't, okay. Okay, and then the other thing I want, every, I hope everyone can keep in mind, is the idea of having these strategies and tools for figuring out and checking your system to make, to make sure things are okay. How do you figure out something's wrong? What do you do when you find something is wrong? And so that, that idea, please keep that in mind as we continue into the, the next session this afternoon. We're gonna take a 15 minute break now, so.